Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the University of Liverpool Spring 2020 WIT talk. My name is Floriana Grasso from the Department of Computer Science at the University of Liverpool, and it's my pleasure to moderate this talk. The Women in Technology or WIT seminars, as we call them, is a series of biannual events organized by the School of Engineering, Electrical Engineering, Electronics and Computer Science uh, since 2017. And these feature leader women scientists working at the cutting edge of technology and with a significant global impact. These are organized on campus in general, and today's presenter was scheduled for our spring talk in March, but obviously we all know what happened. So here we are for the first online WIT talk, and we actually hope it won't be the last. So today's speaker is Patti Koskova, who is a professor in digital health and at University City London, and she's the director of the Centre for Digital Public Health in Emergencies, again at UCL. Patty has conducted world-leading research for the past very many years now, with projects ranging from gamified apps to combat the Zika virus in Brazil, increasing resilience during disaster in Nepal, or strengthening antibiotic uh, resistance uh, um, in, in Nigeria, just to name a few, and has recently been advising the WHO on the digital strategy in the context of COVID-19. She has received many accolades, the latest being the 2019 Innovator of the Year of the Computing Women in IT Awards. And she's then, we believe, the perfect speaker if there ever was one for our first wit online during the global pandemic. So I will leave her the floor soon for, for her talk. But first, I'd like to uh, remind you uh, that Patty will be happy to accept your questions at the end of the talk and that you can post your questions or any comments or uh, maybe uh, like other people questions by using the chat facilities that you will see uh, at the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on your screen. Uh, so Patty, then thanks again for accepting to be with us today. Uh, and um, I'll uh, guess I'll uh, Send you live and over to you. You are mute, I think, Patty. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, um, welcome everyone, and um, thank you for attending the first ever online. Uh, women in Technology event in University of Liverpool. It's my real pleasure to be with you uh, uh, today in the afternoon. And, you know, after the cancellation in March, uh, it's actually quite exciting to have a technology event held online. Uh, it's, a, it's amazing to see 44 attendees uh, in the audience, even though I can't see you. It's exciting to know you there. And I would be, as Floriana said, uh, very happy to accept your questions in the chat on your right hand side after the talk. So yeah, so as Floriana said, I've been working in a digital public health for yeah, 20, 20 almost years, and it's exciting to share some of the highlights of my research uh, with the audience today in this most topical time where suddenly public health and emergencies and digital agenda are on everyone's sort of top priority list. So, um, so sit back uh, and uh, enjoy. And uh, as I said, you can pose the questions online and I will come back to it at the end of the talk. So the talk is called uh, There is an app uh, for that and how digital technologies and social media have shaped our um, our lives and our our health. Well, you know, uh, one of the major major thing which has changed the way we are delivering our health care is is basically the availability of mobile phones. A few years ago, you know, we cannot even imagine what it, what it would be like uh, to not to have a phone to call your friends while you're meeting someone. But in the recent uptake of uh, usage, usage of phones has resulted in uh, more and more people using their phones, regardless of where they are, for checking their health information, for um, arranging a GP appointment, or for running any kind of uh, devices and uh, tracking and wearable and sports and uh, weight loss uh, programs using their mobile phone and quite often streaming the information even online. 
So the um, omnipresence of all those measuring devices, which most of them are now connected to through your mobile phones to the Internet and are enabling sharing information with both medical providers and also uh, our friends and our communities has just become omnipresent. This has resulted in an amazing opportunity for data being shared pretty much in real time and en enabling uh, managing our health in a much more accurate and uh, uh, personally uh, citizens engage way, but also enhancing the public health sector in providing public health uh, advice and information based on information which was in the past impossible to obtain in this granularity and pretty much uh, in real time. The important thing I think we all have noticed in the last uh, few months of the pandemics has been the role of media. Unlike other healthcare sectors, public health and especially emergencies, outbreaks, epidemics are of absolute utter media interest. Unfortunately, the media who jumped on this wagon are not always the kind of media you would like to be sharing healthcare information with citizens around the globe. So, building um, kind of a rapport between uh, professional media and social media in order to actually inform public accurately and uh, responsibly based on evidence is absolute importance of any government's agenda. Unfortunately, we, as you can see, we have governments like Jal Bolsonaro in, the, in Brazil. We also have um, a historical reaction in the US where, you know, the leaders are using the um, media campaigns and media misinformation to, in fact, um, disinform uh, public, unfortunately. So as professionals and healthcare providers, we cannot shy away from engaging with uh, all this misinformation and media discourse across the growing real time um, information broadcasting through traditional and social media. We have to engage and also understand that sometimes, you know, the authorities and the highest leaders are not necessarily on the side of the scientists and public health experts. So what do we do about it? So uh, I kind of move a little bit backwards and saying, well, actually, this is not the first pandemic. Definitely is the most um, prevailing and obviously the most damaging in terms of uh, cases and unfortunately, sadly, a death tool is also the most damaging economically. But you may recall that 10 years ago we actually were in another pandemic. It was the swine flu pandemic. And I'm going to show you a little bit of a film of what our uh, social media have achieved already 10 years ago in combating um, swine flu pandemic. So can you um can you all see the uh, the the screen? Yep. Excellent. Is the sound working? A single idea has the potential to change healthcare forever and the UK has an impressive tradition of innovation that has transformed healthcare. In countries where the government is suppressing free media, Twitter or any public generated content on the internet and social networks could be an invaluable resource identifying possible infectious disease outbreaks. Our final presenter is Dr. Patty Kostkova. She is going to talk about how e-health and social networks will improve global health by 2020. I have a question for you. How many of you have got this device on you at the moment? Virtually everyone. So my talk will show you how we can make the use of our day-to-day -day communication device for improving our health. As people and diseases travel the world, Europeans face an increasing range of threats from existing and new epidemics. Stockholm is where Europe's watchdog agency was set up. We have come to the ECDC, the European Centre of Disease Prevention and Control, which has got remit to support 
European nations and member states in regular surveillance of infectious diseases and providing scientific advice. Patty, this is our whole of fame here. You have the infected mosquitoes during the chikungunya outbreak in, in Ravenna. This one was during the tsunami response in Bandache 2004. This is in Iraq during the avian influenza cases in 2006. This one was a hospital infection investigation in Russia, minus 24 degrees. <laughs> Actually, the center was created after the SARS epidemic, where the member states realized that for such threats as SARS with a global uh, scope, then there is a need to have some coordination at the, at the EU level. In 2005, there was an outbreak of chikungunya, that funny tropical disease originating in Central Africa. So we decided to conduct a risk assessment because that's really what we've been created for. What's the risk for the EU if a situation emerges somewhere in the world? Everyone was convinced that indeed there was a risk for the mm. EU to see some transmission occurring there. So then the preparedness group starts working with the member state to make sure that if it happens, we have the capacity in the EU mm. to diagnose it. Exactly. Nobody was able to diagnose that disease in the EU because it never happened in the EU. Yeah. And then in August 2008, we had the confirmation by Italy that indeed the uh, establishment of the local transmission in Emilia-Romagna had started. And it was exactly the story that our risk assessment showed. It was actually one guy coming back from India, meeting at the wrong time, the wrong mosquito and starting a transmission, yeah, yeah, yeah. ended up with more than 200 cases. The spread of this disease from Italy was contained and the ECDC learned about how to prevent future outbreaks of chikungunya. Early warning of epidemics is crucial and that's why the team constantly monitors both medical reports and all the world's media. A daily meeting considers current threats. On other news, uh, there was an AWS from Belgium yesterday reporting an outbreak of measles in Guinea. We knew about this because it was in the media, at least, that there was the situation in Belgium, so they give a bit more details about this. So um, we got it in the media before we got it from the yeah, National Authorities. Yeah. A week before, That's I would good. say. Last year was the worst year in a couple of years that we had in the EU for measles, and what you're saying is that this year so far it seems to be even worse. So. you to tell the world or at least the followers what you do at the moment what you had for breakfast whether you had a shower which talk you're attending what happened at your work so what about swine flu we have done a study collecting all tweets containing the world flu how many tweets containing this world do you think we have received any guess? 10, 20, 000. Surprisingly enough, we received 3 million tweets from all over the world discussing some kind of aspect of the pandemic or forwarding some of these articles mentioning the influenza. So we look at these particular tweets and compare to what the surveillance data from GPs actually told us about number of cases in the UK last year. And the Twitter discussion slightly anticipated the surveillance reported data. So the Twitter discussions in this large quantity, even though with the noise, which is part of it, can actually predict the pandemic up to a week in this case before the official surveillance, which is important to know for the authorities, for preparedness, for organizations like WHO, ECDC. The vast uh, amount of data can indicate there is some kind of public concerns and we can crowdsource the intelligence straight to those people who might be affected. Prior to the internet, my concern was to get as much information as I could. Now that I have internet, my concern is to get, I wouldn't say as little as I can, but as relevant information as I can. Yeah. 
I do feel a little bit skeptical about using using social media for early detection. I think it's definitely a, a tool or a development that we need to be following up very much in the way that you've been doing with your groundbreaking uh, scientific work. Don't you think investing into research into the social media and not just Twitter, including you know blogs, yeah. any of this user generated content on the web and finding out technologically better adjusted methods for indeed it could lives. be great to get some students or interns and get a project to get the threats what google gave us what the tweets would give us what medicines and the media would give us what, what, the, what the blogs could give us we have a new increase of cases in the sud province and in the, sud. the beauty of twitter was this was tapping into resource people are using anyway people are using in their daily life to tell their friends we are piggybacking on this daily process and capitalizing on this new way of communication and using it for public health purposes. The funeral industry So So it, was, it took us back to uh, the previous uh, pandemics, the spine flu pandemics. And at the time, it was the uh, initial time where um, the idea of using social media and specifically Twitter was born and demonstrated to have uh, a potential to early warn the authorities for an upcoming um, epidemics. Well, let's move on. There has been a lot of uh, interest in uh, looking at um, the searches. Can Google know when diseases are coming up by analyzing uh, user searches? That has been a successful project initially, the Google flu trends, again, at the time of the swine flu, demonstrating, yes, Google can, uh, through the millions of people obviously sharing their uh, searches with Google by using the engine, can predict uh, the swine flu. However, at the, at the end of the day, it was uh, decided that this project actually was uh, not quite predictable in the following seasons and was overfitting and over predicting uh, the increase of cases in a flu in the upcoming post-09 swine flu years. So at the end it was stopped. But however, understanding what actually people are searching, what their concerns are in order to uh, provide them with the information they may want is very, very important. We have developed um, a project uh, on antibiotic resistance, which was a public facing initiative in the UK and analyzed what brought people from Google, Amazon and other en engines into the antibiotic resistance website to better understand if we are genuinely meeting the need of the people who are searching for their health information and landing through Google on our antibiotic resistance public facing website. And what do you think would be the most important and most frequent searches people are typing into Google, bringing them to antibiotic website well we initially thought yeah it would be you know antibiotics and whatever certain antibiotics types and uh, common coughs and cold symptoms no the most common um keywords bringing people were surprisingly enough included the word alcohol or a combination of a word alcohol and antibiotics so of course why was that well People wanted to know if they can drink if they are on antibiotics. And that's the kind of questions you may not necessarily be willing to ask your GP when you are receiving your prescription, but you would go on Google and search and find out for yourself. So we, as a result of uh, analyzing these Google searches, develop an extensive section on which uh, antibiotics you're supposed to and you, you're not supposed to be uh, drinking on to provide uh, appropriate evidence to the public about this important question. Some of the other questions, as you can say, were just, you know, all as you would expect. And um, 
yeah, quick antibiotics, quick working also brings users to antibiotic website. So obviously the reliance on the uh, search engines, uh, exposing ranking and bringing public to the information they may be interested in is, is very important. And I think engaging with the industry through regulation and uh, better access and um, combating fake news, fake websites and deliberate spread of misinformation is of a number one priority at the moment of the internet age, uh, not just because of coronavirus, but because of any other misinformation which could be so easily spread using the media around public health. So some more inf interesting approaches for people who were interested in antibiotic resistance and brought by Google to our website. Well, we also were looking at um, what is influencing what? Is um, public information, public interest, you know, through um, searches and, uh, uh, and um, uh, online information seeking actually driving some of the media agenda and the media coverage, which as we can tell, you know, recently in the coronavirus is excessive. And a lot of it is actually misinforming or inaccurate. Or is the media interest, which is kind of anticipating a wave, actually driving the public fear, a public anxiety, which brings people to starting, you know, to search and go online and find out what's going on and if they have or haven't got the particular disease. So in this paper, we have looked into, well, what is the relationship between the Google searches, the public interest? Again, it goes back to um, the previous pandemic's 09 swine flu. And what is the kind of news coverage analyzing the kind of media database available through Guardian? And as you can say, in the spring uh, wave of the uh, 2009 swine flu, actually the black line, you know, as you can see here, is exceeding by roughly a week the, the green line. So the public searches, people going on Google searching about information about spine flu and the symptoms actually preceded the massive and often misinformed media coverage about spine flu. So it also shows that looking into the correlation and understanding what generates the interest, what drives the anxiety between the searches and the media is very important. Well, moving on, let's just jump a continent and look at Brazil. One of our initiatives is uh, combating a uh, Zika virus in Brazil in a northeast uh, province of Pernambuco and Paraíba, where we work uh, with University of Campina Grande and um, University of Pernambuco. Well, luckily enough in Europe and in the UK, Zika virus isn't endemic or isn't endemic yet. With global warming, you know, we'll see what's going to come to Europe uh, in the next couple of decades. However, in the tropical part of Brazil and Africa, Zika virus, which is transmitted by uh, mosquitoes, is endemic and um, could be obviously dangerous to human, although many humans have got mild symptoms and recover very quickly. However, the most important thing is uh, getting a Zika virus for pregnant women, which could result in uh, a defect of the uh, baby called microcephaly. So we are working with local authorities who are visiting uh, properties in those two provinces to monitor um, standing water and uh, the existence of mosquito populations in the city of Recife and Campina Grande. At the moment, they are using paper-based data collection, so they're filling in papers when they find mosquitoes and uh, when they treat them and kill them in wa standing water. So with our system, they're using mobile phones where they can enter the information directly, electronically, in real time, and inform the authorities as soon as a potential occurrence of mosquitoes is uh, is discovered. So it's not just about entering the information, which obviously the agents who do this daily work, daily routine work really like. It's also for the authorities to have an overview. You can see the map of Recife, the capital of, um, of the state of Paraíba, where they can see from our uh, real-time mobile surveillance systems, which provinces, which part of the city may have a high risk, um, high risk hotspots where the mosquitoes seem to be breeding. They could either be some dangerous standing water or there are lakes or rivers where the mosquitoes are happily breathing and it requires immediate public health action. So the system is providing early warning and is graphically displaying where those hotspots potentially, potentially are. So the system brings together obviously a mapping, mapping um, of the diseases, brings together the, the routine data from the animal, in this case um, the vector-borne mosquito surveillance. It also brings together the news and Twitter and other information sources to have an overview, overview picture of what actually is going on from as many heterogeneous sources as possible to advance the response and public health.
How many of you are playing games on your phones or on your desktops? Hands up. I can't see your hands, but I, I can imagine many hands are up at the moment. So our other um, challenge we're working on is looking at um, computer games. Uh, and computer games, um, you know, you would make perhaps imagine this is something which kids are interested in or teenagers and, you know, gaming is something which is for fun, but actually games also could be educational. So the um, the domain, the research domain called Serious Games is investigating the use of um, gamification and games in order to uh, educate the audience, not just for fun, but also learn something about their health. So one of our projects, which was a big EU initiative for children, has uh, been teaching children understanding of microbes. And uh, you, you can see that there have been fantastic artists on board uh, showing how microbes can look like. And, you know, they were actually kind of copying the actual shape. You can see under microscope how like fungi look like. So the kind of green one with multiple eyes is penicillin. And you could also see that the color was kind of shading which microbes are good for you, can improve your health, and which bacteria and viruses are bad for you. They were a bit kind of dark, darker and angry faced. And the kids were kind of learned through little uh, mechanics demonstrating what um, what can happen if you are playing with, um, you know, with, with microbes. So let me again share the... share the audience with you. So as you can tell, you know, in this specific specific uh, layer of the, um, the the children's game, there is a little green uh, bacteria is Lucy lactobacillus and Lucy is being used for a good thing. Lucy is used to make a yogurt. So the kids are supposed to jump on the bread with a with a jam and the sausage and push three Lucy's into the glass of milk. And as you can say, the milk turns uh, kind of pinkish and it becomes yogurt. So the idea is to educate children that actually bugs are mostly bad for you. It makes you ill, but also some of the bugs are used for a good purpose, like making bread and yogurt. You can also see that uh, the uh, the bugs could be used for, you know, destroying this horrible purple um, um, infection in your body. And by throwing antibiotics onto it, the player is kind of told that using uh, antibiotics can kill infection. And also the idea in the specific um, specific level was to deliver the full course. So if you prescribe antibiotics, you should use all the antibiotics in your course in order to actually get rid of the infection and not to create antibiotic resistance, which is partially created if people are stop using the antibiotics halfway through the course, even before they, when, when they feel a bit better before the infection is fully, fully damaged. So this game was um, was played in the European countries. It was translated into 10 languages and we could demonstrate that kids genuinely learned and the most popular and the highest, the, the most successful learning objective in teaching kids about the game was actually the one with the Lucilactobacillus being pushed into the milk. Well, you might be thinking, you know, games education, that's all good for you. But what about, you know, adults? Would actually adults play game as well and, and learn about their health? Well, surprisingly enough, yes. One of our other projects, which we recently finished, was an initiative in Nepal called Mantra, where we work with um, rural women in a rural parts of Nepal. You can see how fantastically beautiful uh, saris and, uh, and dresses they're wearing, they're wearing. And unfortunately, a lot of them are in a very, very deprived poor conditions. There is a very low literacy. Some of them are still illiterate, unfortunately. And also the availability of mobile phones and smartphones is extremely limited. So when we kind of did this initial assessment exercise, we thought, oh my goodness, you know, how are we going to be using games education for an audience which is so remote, which is really, you know, deprived of the access of information and smartphones we are absolutely used to in Europe? And how do we deal with the issues of, um, of illiteracy? The, uh, the project was uh, teaching three different modules, maternal health, uh, improving the understanding of women about uh, dangerous conditions and signs during pregnancy and around birth. 
neonatal health, so improving understanding about you know, the common conditions for their baby and newborns, especially as many of them live hours and hours away from the nearest hotspots and health spots and need to be able to understand if the condition is or isn't serious. And also understanding geohazards. A lot of people after the devastating earthquake in 2014 didn't actually die during the earthquake, but after the earthquake as a result of landslides or, or rock falls, etc. So we work with local authorities and with uh, a charity to develop an absolutely no text, only pictogram based uh, educational game where we use a uh, local and UK based artists to draw uh, conditions which would be communicating a uh, high or low risk um, condition for neonatal, for maternal health and also for the geohazards. And these were incorporated into a very simple kind of drag and drop game where they were supposed to differentiate which condition is more dangerous. Does it need to be uh, urgently transferred to a hospital? And by urgently in Nepalese context, it still may, may need like four or five hours before the ambulance comes down in the off road and takes the, uh, the, the woman uh, or, the, or the baby uh, back to a ideally hospital, but in many cases just a local uh, health spot. Or is it something usual which happens to like most babies and it's just enough to be seen maybe in, by a nurse who comes once a week to the village. So how risky is various uh, conditions and how risky are those various uh, landslides and the geohazards was the part of the game. Again, we were absolutely uh, excited that uh, several of these learning conditions were statistically significantly teaching the women and improving their understanding of the geohazards and neonatal and uh, the maternal health. And most importantly, even though some of them actually held a smartphone in their hand for the first time in their life, and we have to show them how to do drag and drop and how to touch screen because this is something they've never seen and never done before. They very quickly just grasped the skill and because the game mechanics was specifically designed to be only drag and drop and you know easy to easy to understand the logic behind it they loved playing it and even though the sessions were like scheduled for like two or three hours they still like to continue when, when we were finishing and seem like you know this is something they uh, they would love to do they understand it was improving their understanding and empowering them to have to make better decisions for themselves and for their for their babies so it's not just children who are learning, it's also could be uh, adults, even uh, in the most deprived and, um, and disadvantaged conditions. So we're going to move continent again and we're going to go to Africa. Antibiotic resistance is a major global issue. It's one of the things which is kind of at the same power as global warming. And as we do something about it, it's going to cost them billions to combat it in the future. And it may result in a failure of uh, antibiotics we are known today to actually effectively work. So we may go to the times when, you know, humans didn't have um, an effective cure for diseases like TB. And we may uh, unfortunately kind of reverse the development of public health since the development of penicillin uh, 70 years ago. So Antibiotic resistance is really important. So the more we use antibiotics, the more the bugs get used to them and become resistant. So what do we do about it? So we can slow it down. We can't really stop using them because we still need the treatment, but we need to slow down this process of antibiotic resistance. So one of the way we, how we can stop it is by limiting overprescribing. So being aware when you do need and when you don't need antibiotics, not be pressurizing your GP to give you antibiotics for a common cough and cold, which is very often viral and antibiotics don't even work on it. And uh, obviously educate and train the professionals to be much more prudent when prescribing. This issue is global. However, uh, the situation in, uh, in Africa, in Nigeria is, is specifically difficult because there is an over counter sale of antibiotics possible. So the professionals and the public, you know, have a different perception of this global problem. So we developed um, a game which was a um, kind of decision support system advising surgeons in three hospitals in Nigeria whether their prescription decision was correct according to WHO guidelines or whether they are over prescribing or prescribing something else. So you can say that we, uh, when they enter information about what uh, the patient is uh, suffering, which um, uh, hospital surgery he or she is attending, we gave an advice and saying, well, okay, you know, this is a high risk procedure, you should prescribe. This is a 
the lowest procedure, you shouldn't. And when they enter the actual um, antibiotics and the duration of the course, again, we check it against the guidelines and give a feedback whether this is in line with the guidelines or not. And we have measured a quite a significant improvement in terms of compliance with the guidelines. And you may be surprised why, you know, this feedback, the red and uh, red and green feedback is given by a dog and dog wearing, you know, glasses and a white coat. So in a, in serious persuasive games, the role of a mentor is quite important. It's some kind of authority character which speaks to you uh, through the game or in this kind of, it's more a decision support system and establishes some kind of authority uh, notion. And we have done a several focus group with our colleagues in Nigeria thinking, well, they may want a human kind of mentor, you know, a doctor and will they choose male or female or will they like to perhaps personalize, you know, whether they would like to see a female mentor or male, male mentor. And we have also included a few, a few animals. And like surprising enough, after very vibrant focus groups, uh, the local experts, even though they're senior clinicians and surgeons, have actually chosen a dog as their most favorite mentor. And they have give, given us a lot of advice about how the dog should be dressed, you know, the white coat and the glasses. So actually it looks like a doctor's dog. And uh, this is something which was actually developed by, by our um, skilled artist into the mentor image, which has been kind of communicating the feedback in this game throughout the game. So that's an interesting sort of a culture, um, culture um, result with uh, professionals in Nigeria. We didn't expect at the beginning of the project. And of course, you know, people like to be rewarded. So uh, the surgeons were rewarded for uh, prescribing correctly, for using the app on a daily basis, for changing their decisions and improving the compliance, etc. And it also led to uh, an improvement of the results. So just to give you a bit of a visual idea, these are the three hospitals where we worked. So two of them are in Lagos and one is in the Delta region in the south of Nigeria. And we have got about uh, 90 surgeons on board who've been using the, uh, the app for six months, recording their prescription decisions when they've seen a patient going for surgery. And we have demonstrated uh, in the decision about uh, the, the risk or low risk of, um, of the surgery, 69% six, change to compliance. So a lot of kind of hand holding and a WhatsApp support has gone into it and helping them to do it and awarding them through the WhatsApp games so that it's been amazing to see su such an excitement and such a support from very again low deprived country where the technology has enabled a dramatic change towards a better compliance and towards combating um, antibiotic resistant. So and finally we all are expecting you know what's going on in COVID. Of course, when I was preparing for my talk uh, in the beginning of the year when Foria invited me, it was before the whole thing erupted in Europe. So I have uh, since then got involved in several COVID projects and I would just like to share with you uh, one of them. Um, so my lockdown journal project has a, a component uh, which is a, a mobile app. So this is the Google Play Store. So you all excited, if you're excited, you can download the app. It's called My Lockdown Journal. This is what it looks like, and it helps you to be recording your activity on a daily basis. And you can record whether you are doing it kind of the way you, you used to, whether you're doing it online, because now we do a lot of things on Zoom, whether you have changed the way you do it, or whether you have um, perhaps invented some new activity, taken a new hobby, started learning new language. So it helps people to journal the, the, throughout the, the lockdown and the post lockdown periods, which is improving mental health and well-being. And it also allows us to collect data about how people shifted their, their daily activities, both professional and social, to better understand how the population adapted to the change conditions. And we work with WHO and PHE and we will advise them on what worked and what didn't. So the app is one component, but you can also join in a social media competition. So my lockdown journal, you can see the um, the, the logo and the uh, the account is running on uh, Instagram and on um, Twitter. On both, it's called my lockdown journal. So if you search and follow it, you can be posting pictures of your activities. It could be like a fantastically hand drawn uh, journal, which this, this person has posted or your picture, photograph, or just kind of some kind of joke. And it's really amazing to see what people are sharing and uh, what they are, what kind of ideas and how creative the uh, population has become, you know, since April, since the kind of heaviest time of the lockdown when we launched the competition and the app. And every week we award a winner. 
and the winner gets kind of a, a visibility on social media, both in our DPHE professional account, but also through this community on the My Lockdown Journal, which has been steadily growing uh, since we launched the competition. And we also have launched um, um, a survey on SurveyMonkey, um, assessing how people have changed their behavior. And you can just see in this world cloud what people uh, have started doing um, more often since the lockdown started. So a lot of people has been uh, exercising, you know, more than once a day as opposed to before. And also a lot of people have been uh, praying or meditating or doing yoga again like more than one uh, once uh, once a day since the lockdown started so it's been really interesting to see how quickly people adjusted and uh, how willing the uh, population has been in sharing the data through um, the through the survey we're going to be continuing the survey to see how how we uh, can assess the differences people are now going back into kind of semi-normal lives and what uh, changes they will maintain in their post-covid time or kind of uh, post lockdown, but still COVID time, and perhaps where people will be reverting back to their pre COVID behavior. So the uh, so the online survey, the social media competitions and the uh, Google uh, game, the Apple will be launched um, in about two weeks time is kind of assessing what people do, but also giving people a time to play journal and share their fantastic ideas and win a social media competition. So uh, to conclude my talk, so um, in in my in my career, I have got um, I've been fortunate to uh, see a lot of media interest in the work uh, we do. So you can see uh, BBC was interested in this eBay game I was showing to you, and uh, there has been some media coverage in in TV. And last year, um, I've been really privileged to win the Innovator of the Year uh, prize for women in computing in IT excellence. Um, and yeah, this was for the Gazda project, the Nigerian initiative. Um, and um, before we finish, I would like to draw your attention to the UCL Center I'm heading on digital public health in emergencies. And I also would like to obviously thank you to everyone in my team who has been working on the, the Twitter project, the Mantra, Zika, Gazda, the Edu Games for All People, and of course my uh, colleagues who have joined us recently to um, contribute to the My Lockdown Journal initiative. So you can email me on my UCL account and you're most welcome to follow me on Twitter or follow uh, the UCL DPHE Center on Twitter if you're interested in digital public health for more professional perspective. So thank you very much for the attention and I'll be very happy to take questions. Well, thank you, Patsy, ever so much. That was a, a very interesting talk. Um, so let's look at a kind of virtual class for everybody <laughs> as you're here. Um, if you, if you have, feel free to ask questions in the chat if you like, but before before you do, I probably would ask a couple myself, even if we are a bit running out of time, but that, that, that's so probably it's an interesting afternoon. Um, so the first question is, I guess, on, on uh, what is, according to you, what is the project that you think has taught you the most? So the thing that, that surprised you the most between the ones you've mentioned so far? Oh, that's an interesting question. Oh, I love you, Floriana. Um, it's hard to answer. I think one of the most rewarding projects would have been the initiative in Nepal. We initially, when we got the funding, thought, you know, it would be incredibly difficult to develop a technological solution in a quite short time span for um, a target audience, for a community which is so different to what we normally are working with and you know the challenges have been uh, have been massive so seeing those women you know in those sort of groups playing uh, with the smartphone games and you know scoring scoring points and really enjoying it and obviously improving their understanding of their health and their uh, health of their babies have been i think one of the most rewarding uh, part of my career I would also maybe say that, you know, uh, starting to work uh, with Twitter uh, during the swine flu years, um, the idea was coming from a, my, one of my postdocs at the time, Ed De Kinsey, who is now at Kiel, 
And it was just like really random idea. He was just saying, well, you know, I'm just enjoying this Twitter. It was way before any celebrity or any presidents and any authorities were on Twitter. It was just a little kind of a almost geeky um, social media platform in 2009. You know, those of you who were not on Twitter at the time, there was no retweet button. You have to write RT and copy the tweet you wanted to retweet. So a really quirky environment. But at the time, just, let's just give it a shot. So Ed set up this uh, API to be scanning uh, social media for on Twitter at the time and uh, we were absolutely shocked when we received so many tweets and when we actually you know developed this new branch of our research around early warning using social media and Twitter uh, 10 years ago. So there was a very surprising and you know sometimes the ideas don't really come from uh, well thought through textbooks and uh, long proposals. It could be a spontaneous idea like I had at the time and which worked. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, perhaps, I mean, I will ask another question now and then I, I guess we will need to, to stop because it's uh, really running out of time. We, we said we will stop a quarter to, but so just one more, which is my personal interest. And uh, I'm, as you know, very interested in, in, the, in what persuades people to do things. And uh, you, you, you've shown us a number of things that they do just that. Um, but I also think that kind of the, the largest pandemic right now is the misinformation one. So how can we, I mean, if, if we, if there is perhaps one of the, um, the, 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 the danger uh, of the current pandemic is people not wearing masks, so people not, not keeping social distance and so on, and, and, and sometimes brag about it. So it is not just a matter of not knowing or a matter of uh, uh, not, cannot do it but just a matter of, of um, uh, just deciding not to. So what do you think can be done to address behaviours and, and kind of, you know, um, attitudes rather than um, maybe the, the, the most practical um, diseases? Very good question. Thank you, um, Floriana. So definitely um, the misinformation and fake news information on social media and uh, even normal media is it's also um, an epidemic of sort. It's often called infodemics. And this is what we are obviously facing as citizens or as researchers and obviously as public health authorities have to be combating this avalanche of you know, nonsense coming from Twitter. So I think there is an element of better understanding uh, quality of information and responsible searches and responsible social media use, where I think not enough has been done to help public to understand how easy it is to spread misinformation, fake news, or even maliciously, purposefully um, generated information through bots and uh, trolls which are purposefully misleading uh, misleading citizens around their health. So I think better understanding on the public side and citizen side is one of the components in combating it. The other component would be better regulations on the social media giants. You know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they have their responsibility on allowing these platforms to be used for misinformation. And I think we have seen this massive um, infodemics around the recent um, pandemics or coronavirus, but also in the political arena, we also see how dev devastating it is to allow uh, misinformation before elections to uh, sparkle through social media. And now we have seen the Russian report uh, finally published in the UK, demonstrating there has been a, you know, an influence from Russian authorities to influence the, influence the decisions through social media. So better regulations in terms of um, taking responsibility, shutting down accounts which are spreading misinformation and investigating officially what is going on and who is behind all those social media campaigns is very important. The behaviour component, Floriana asked, is really, is, is the kind of holy grail, you know, we know what we should do. We know we should social distance. We know we should wear masks. You know, we have got, I think, the knowledge, but translating knowledge into behavior is, is the most important thing. And I think part of it is there must be, um, there must be a trust where the society believes that the public health authorities and governments are actually advising them in their best interest. So building a rapport uh, politically and socially, the kind of social contract between citizens and 
and their leaders during an emergency and, and pandemics like this, I think is an essential thing. And when this doesn't exist, like we have seen, you know, the US situation, Bolsonaro, you know, Johnson, we have leaders where this trust has been sort of partially broken. And I think these countries seem to be suffering the worst response and the highest death toll in comparison to country where the trust has been better maintained and this led into people actually more uh, likely to comply with the behavior requested by the authorities. Sure, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll just pick up one of the other questions from the audience, um, which is perhaps slightly more uh, technical. So um, Mooney is asking, how does Patty ensures that data privacy and security are not breached? Well, Good question. I think data privacy and all data data governance is one of the most important challenges of our generation. The data have became what oil used to be a generation back. You know, it is the most precious commodity where at the moment a few companies could make trillions worth profit by selling and using our data or data generated by citizens, while the citizens under the current regulatory, regulatory framework haven't got a right to control the usage of their data as much as they should. So I think we should kind of really have a debate about you know, who owns the data or who should be in charge of deciding how the data generated through social media, Google searches, uh, any a kind of app which is streaming information about our physical activity and wearables, where the data go, who uses them, how the data is being used, are they being available for sale, who keeps the profit and how do we share the profit from the IT giants back to the society and the citizens who are the originator of the data without which, you know, no social media and no, um, no uh, IT and mobile industry would have existed. So I think, you know, how do we ensure it? I think one thing is, is, is the regulation. So one of the best kind of steps in this direction, but is the first step not sufficient, is the GDPR, so the European Commission regulation to uh, give rights to citizens to better control how their data are being used in by the IT industry. And enforcing, obviously, this legislation, which uh, I think is still an open challenge. And, no, and of course, trying to uh, really legally address if there are any known breaches to data privacy and data security by certain company or owners. Thank you. Thank you very so much. I think we will have sadly to stop here. It was a very interesting afternoon. Thank you very much for this contribution uh, and you, you will see a lot of uh, thank you also in the chat <laughs> once you have the chance to look at it. Patty. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon um, and uh, the talk will be, it has been recorded so the link will be available and you will be sent the link through uh, email as soon as we uh, set it up on the website. So thank you ever so much to Patty again and thank you uh, all for being uh, with us this afternoon and um, till next time, till the next week talk. Thanks very much. Bye now. <laughs>